gentlemen, welcome back to the shop. Uh, today we're going to be taking a look at the basic types and applications of protective relays. Uh, we're going to define a lot of useful terms and introduce ideas that will be critical for the rest of the series, though this isn't the most hands-on video. This is really for the uninitiated, trying to get you up to speed on what we're going to cover in the other videos. Without further ado, uh, heat is far and away the number one enemy of all electrical power systems, from the CPU in your laptop to the largest 500 kV transformers and transmission lines. Heat is the number one enemy. The amount of current required to flow through a circuit under normal operation will dictate the size of the wire we need to use to deliver power to the load because there's an inverse relationship between the cross-sectional area of a wire and its resistance. If that last sentence was news to you, you're definitely watching the wrong video. Sorry, goodbye. For the rest of you, buckle up because it's just going to spiral out of control and get way more complicated from here. Anytime an excessive amount of current flows through a circuit, the wiring can get dangerously hot. The wiring in your house, for example, needs to be prevented from overheating so that your home doesn't burn down when you plug in that air fryer from Timu. We can take advantage of the relationship between wire size and heat, though. If you've ever looked inside one of those uh, cheap little electronics fuse, you can see it's just a thin little wire in there. Bigger, larger rated fuses are almost identical, except they use sand or some uh, other like medium or some mechanical action to extinguish the arc when the circuit burns open inside the fuse. Engineers essentially designate a safe failure point of the circuit by plopping in a single use replaceable fuse cartridge in the circuit, uh, which will get too hot and melt itself open in the event of an overload or a short. That's circuit protection 101. Fuses are great and all, but what if we don't want to throw away a big expensive hunk of copper and sand uh, every time you plug in the air fryer? Fortunately, someone invented a resettable fuse shortly after the turn of the last century. Rather than melting all the way through, it essentially consists of a metal spring that expands uh, when it gets hot, causing a mechanical lever to push open metal contact pads fast enough to break the circuit. Hence, circuit breaker. Uh, once the overload or fault condition has stopped, the spring will cool, allowing the contacts to be mechanically shut again and restore power. Miniature circuit breakers like this, uh, likely found in your home breaker box, are work shockingly similar to the way that they did nearly 100 years ago. Engineers can tweak and fine-tune heat-related tripping time of the breakers to match the thermal damage curve of equipment like cables and transformers. I talk a lot more about uh, trip curves in this video here or here or wherever it goes on the screen. I'll also have it linked down below. Here's an example of a thermal damage curve for a cable. We make sure that the operating time of the breaker, the, the time that it takes the breaker to trip given a, a certain amount of current, we make sure that that is lower than the thermal damage curve of the cable or whatever we're trying to protect. Um, it needs to be lower in both the magnitude on the horizontal axis and lower in duration to trip uh, on the vertical axis to prevent the cable from overheating and starting a fire or damaging the cable or irreparably damaging the motor or whatever we're trying to protect. Despite common misconception, having to reset a breaker after a thermal trip is significantly better than having your house burned down because of an air fryer. Obviously, breakers like this are a huge improvement over fuses, but there are three major downsides. First, they aren't efficient and add resistance and heat load that does have an impact on the overall power system. From Ohm's law, we know that power dissipation is equal to I squared times R, or current squared times the resistance. As we make breakers larger and larger to handle more and more current, sometimes in the, the thousands or tens of thousands of amps, we really need to have the smallest R, or resistance value, as possible. Intentionally putting a heater coil in the middle of a breaker isn't the smartest choice, sometimes, on the bigger end. Uh, second, this type of protection doesn't react fast enough in the event of a sudden arc flash or short circuit. Smaller, modern, low-voltage breakers for commercial or industrial applications get around this by having a separate magnetic trip unit that is also in, in series, and that trips at a fixed amount of current very, very rapidly. However, this also isn't practical on the large end because it's a thing that you have to put in series with the breaker. Uh, third, this type of protection can't distinguish between normal current flow through the system and current leaving the system to ground, often called a ground fault. So what's the solution? 
using special transformers to measure current called <laughs> creatively enough uh, current transformers, we can efficiently and accurately measure the current of a circuit externally and move the protection device out of the main current path. I'm going to make a whole video or two on current transformers by themselves. Um, I'll also have a, a link below to some other people who did a really good job of explaining it. The long and short of it is that instead of having to make our protection devices part of the power circuit in series with the load and able to withstand, you know, thousands of volts or tens of thousands of amps, CTs step down a proportional amount of current so we can use smaller, high precision devices that normally see less than five amps to determine when to trip. I'm talking about relays specifically in this series, uh, the kind that you find in very, very large low voltage systems um, or medium voltage and high voltage systems like we find in substations. However, if you've ever seen a breaker like this with a trip unit, a trip unit is just a small overcurrent relay installed inside a breaker. It's not in series with the power circuit like a thermal magnetic trip unit is. There are current sensors or CTs bringing a low level uh, analog current signal to the trip unit the exact same way that a relay works. It's all just built into one nice tight little low voltage package. Moving back to relays, uh, if we look at this example of a transmission substation, the primary side of the CT, aka the bus, is at 34 0.5 kV, that's 35,000 volts, and can carry up to 1,200 amps. It looks like this in real life. That's a lot more power than a thermal breaker like this can reasonably handle. But on the secondary side of the CT, there's much less energy. According to the ratio listed here, 1,200 amps on the primary would be about 5 amps on the secondary. This uh, also provides galvanic isolation from the bus, so we can treat the secondary wiring in general as if it's safe low voltage wiring. Low voltage and five-ish amps is a lot easier to deal with and plug into a computer or a precision instrument than 35 kV and 1200 amps. Like that's just a tremendous amount of power. So the CT secondary circuit is then routed into the control house and wired up to the star of this whole YouTube series, a mother relay. From the dawn of civilization, if we define the dawn of civilization as 1905, protection relays uh, mostly look like this electromechanical one. They rely on electromagnetic forces moving solenoids and spinning disks and goofy stuff like that. In this example, uh, when the current from the CT exceeds whatever the pickup is, in this case it's four amps, uh, current flows through this little magnet back here and spins a disk, physically moves. It's pretty wild. Um, and when the two contacts in the middle of the relay, won't focus on that, but when the two contacts in the middle of the relay close, it energizes the trip circuit. They call it the trip circuit because when it's energized, it sends a trip signal to the breaker, telling the breaker to open because of a fault. Really knocking out the, uh, knocking out the lingo today. The movement and speed of the disc can be adjusted and tweaked by engineers to roughly match the thermal damage curve of a given circuit. Unlike most breakers though, it's actually really easy to change that characteristic on the fly, as long as it's paired with the right CTs. Whereas a breaker would need to be specced out precisely for the application and possibly changed out entirely uh, if the circuit changes in some way. These old clicky spinny boys are a, just a technical marvel compared to dumb old thermal breakers. But wait, you may ask, what about shorts and high current faults? Well, this one has an instantaneous trip unit, which when current exceeds a given point, it will trip instantaneously, sending a trip circuit to the breaker in the event of a, a very, very high current fault, which is really cool. Believe it or not, many of these electromechanical relays survive in service today. Uh, perhaps owing entirely to survivor bias, these old guys seem to be just absolutely dead nuts reliable when properly maintained and regularly tested, that is. I enjoy, I truly enjoy the craftsmanship, the finesse, and the very hands-on method of tweaking relays like this into calibration. I think they're amazing. That said, they're no match to modern relays. They should be replaced and phased out. Right around the time of Atari and affordable housing, we determined spinny clicky boys weren't as good as solid silicon. Solid state relays, also called static relays, are notable for having no moving parts. 
no chunky magnets, no communication ports, no display like we find on newer relays, and solid state uh, protection circuitry. These were kind of a lame gap year in Ohio between the hardworking, long-lasting boomer electromechanical relays of yesteryear and the modern microprocessor-based relays that were just a few decades away. I have a few of these in my collection from the yeah, late 80s, 90s, and I don't think any of them work 100% right as of 2024. Uh, while they're easier to set, uh, they had a wider application range, more options, and could be more accurate out of the box than ye old electromechanical relay. The Achilles heel of almost everything from this era tended to be leaky capacitors, unreliable power supplies, and irreparably drifting uh, analog to digital converter chips, the actual silicon in there that did most of the, the heavy lifting. They just go bad over time. Uh, they weren't designed as well as what we have nowadays. The material science really wasn't there. They're just not as good, they don't last as long. All that is to say, uh, there usually isn't much to do once these goobers start to slip out of calibration range. Uh, PSA, if you're ever walking a job site and you see a BBC circuit shield relay, uh, tell them in no uncertain words that they're all well past the end of their service life and they need to be retrofitted immediately. That brings us to today and relays that are essentially amped up PCs designed to protect our grid. Uh, the modern microprocessor-based multifunction protection relay is massively powerful. Secure and high-speed communications baked right into the protection relays means we can get real-time monitoring data straight from the horse's mouth or get cheeky and use the trip and close functions for automated control of uh, substations and breakers and all sorts of other fun stuff. Really cool. Due to the massive increase in processing power, we can cram dozens of protection functions into one little box instead of having one protection function per box per phase. For the same level of protection offered by a wall of electromechanical or solid state relays, we can use a single multifunction relay like the 751 or uh, one of these 411s. We've been talking about overcurrent and thermal protection up to this point because that's probably 80 to 90% of the circuit protection out there in the world. But what if you needed to sh safely shut off a system whenever the power goes out? Or you have sensitive equipment that'll catch fire if the voltage dips too low? Certain applications like elevators and automatic transfer switches need to detect under voltage conditions. So we use the aptly named under voltage relay uh, similar to how CTs are used to get proportional current from a power circuit, small transformers are used to measure the voltage, often called VTs or PTs. Uh, they're used in the same way to get a safe-ish voltage signal, uh, usually between 60 and 120 volts, down to the protection relay for measuring. Another super common application is called uh, directional current or directional power protection. Since a generator is just an electric motor with a diesel engine or a gas turbine bolted to it, uh, when connected to another power source like the grid, it can be completely destroyed if you run out of fuel or you lose control of the engine because the other power source is going to push backwards motoring the engine. It's really, really bad. At best, you'll blow a gasket. At worst, you'll find an entire piston in the oil pan. Power flowing out of the generator is good, but power flowing into the generator is bad. We can take the current from the CTs, the voltage from the PTs, and use Ohm's law and a little math to determine which direction it's flowing and protect our generator or parallel circuits. Uh, reverse power is totally invisible, right? It doesn't matter which way you get shocked from, it still hurts like a bitch. To a relay, the difference is in ones and zeros. So we have to model it with vector diagrams and some intimidating but totally reasonable math. I'll have some links below regarding phaser diagrams like this uh, so you can get your feet wet, but we'll talk about those when we get there in a future video, I promise. Transmission lines can be hundreds of miles long and it would sure suck to have to walk the whole line in order to find out which single tree branch or errant air fryer caused the circuit to trip. We can use that goofy old Ohm's law and very precise wild guesses regarding the resistance to the soil to determine the distance to the fault. 
Distance protection relays like this sound completely made up unless you've seen them before, but they do play a critical role in keeping the grid stable. Engineers can model the impedance of a transmission line and phase-to-phase -phase or phase-to-ground faults, allowing us to program relays to determine how far along a line the problem is. This can then be used to coordinate tripping between multiple substations, and if you're wondering, yes, uh, someone figured out how to do this way back in the electromechanical days. They're enormous and absolutely miserable to calibrate if you run into them, but they protected our grid for over half a decade. Microprocessor relays are just way better at it. Some parts of a circuit are much more expensive to replace after a failure than others. Some parts are more prone to failure than others. Transformers are both. <laughs> Using two or more sets of current transformers pointed at each other like a Mexican standoff, we can ignore current flowing normally through the system, flowing to the load, and only determine our protection based off the current that is leaving the circuit in that zone of protection. Back in the day, you'd have to configure a whole circuit for the electromechanical version of one of these differential relays to reject the differences in phase angle, CT ratio, or CT saturation. It was a feat of engineering fortitude to get these complex protection circuits set up with the correct phase shifting transformers, uh, relay settings when paired to an oddball transformer setup with less than ideal CTs. Nowadays, we just have the nerds in an office whip up a settings file in an afternoon on their computer and we can have the relay figure out if the current in a differential system is flowing normally or if it's flowing into the transformer into ground causing an issue. This type of protection is extremely accurate at identifying a fault when compared to most other ways that we do it nowadays. Um, to the point that we actually need to compensate for the, the saturation rate of the CTs at varying load levels. Still, testing a 387 or a T90 can be a huge pain in the ass for some of the wild applications they shoehorn differential relays into. All these functions and many more have been performed by decades with microprocessor relays, solid state relays, and electromechanical ones. Microprocessor relays just tend to do it better and are more reliable at this day and age. Owing mainly to the fact that they can do tons of these functions all in one box with integrated SCADA, touch screens, instead of having one old rusty box per function per phase. But at the end of the day, our job is to make sure they work, right? We're relay testing techs. How do we prove they work? I, spoiler, I've got somewhere between 10 and 50 videos coming up to show you just that. For the most part, uh, you're gonna be using a purpose-built software controlled high precision multifunction relay test set to simulate faults. That's what we do. We simulate all of the things that we're trying to protect the power circuit from. Don't worry, it sounds really intimidating uh, because it is. It's actually really fucking hard. But we'll get through it. Overcurrent, undervoltage, differential, synchronizing, patronizing, all of those can and need to be tested and I'm gonna show it to you. Due to how stupidly dangerous uh, electricity is, It's the relay tech's responsibility to make sure the protection devices are installed and configured and functioning properly. Do the settings make sense for this application? Does the relay work as it's configured? Can the relay trip the breaker when it senses a fault? We need to prove that, show that it works, and then create the documentation to hand off to, inevitably hand off to the customer's insurance agent. There's a lot to it and a ton rests on your shoulders. So ideally, as a third party need a tester or a utility relay tech, you get paid to go to a fancy, expensive relay training, or you'll get to an apprentice under a senior tech who's done this a million times. This is the real world though, this isn't ideal. Some guys don't get enough time in the classroom. Some guys have shitty mentors. Some guys get handed a relay test set and are told to do their best, totally raw dogging projects with zero training and zero regard for their own safety. That's how I learn. So that, that's where I come in now. That's testing tech tips is here to fill all of your gaps in knowledge as it pertains to testing relays. 
the next few videos are going to be way more hands-on. Uh, you'll get the high point of watching over the shoulder of a guy who actually knows what he's doing without the low points of getting screamed at for dropping the tool bag. Make sure you're subscribed uh, because a lot of the videos are going to be pretty hands-on. It's actually just going to be me testing a relay, telling you what I'm doing, how I'm doing it, how I figure things out as I go because like, you don't know everything. You can never know everything. There's too many types of relays out there. So a lot of it's gonna be, here's how I get to a point where I understand what's going on, here's how we solve the problems that are kinda of come up along the way, and here's sort of my thought process on how to put the whole thing together in your head to make it make sense. It's gonna be a lot of that. There's gonna be a couple software tutorials, a couple like very specific relay application things, and unfortunately, there's gonna be a couple videos just on math. There's some math out there that's it sucks. I, I, I don't want to do it to you guys, but you really need to learn it. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. We'll get through it together, I'm sure. So make sure you're subscribed. Um, yeah, stay safe out there, and uh, I'll see you on the next one. Thanks, guys.